Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, the culture talk about getting the bag. I'm here with an amazing panel uh, representing different brands, different companies. Uh, I'm your host, Carmen. I'll be asking questions. I've told the panel, please interact with one another and ask each other questions, because I think everybody holds interesting knowledge about careers, about choices, about decisions. But please feel free, audience, to ask questions as well. Um, just stand up, raise your hand, interrupt me, or interrupt one of the speakers, well, not one of the speakers, interrupt me, <laughs> when you want to ask your questions, and then we'll make sure that uh, you can pose your question. I'll probably have to repeat it, because I don't think there's a mic going around the audience, but we'll make it work. We'll do this one in English, because the, the panel is international. Um, so I hope everybody understands us pretty well. And I start with a classical question so that you know who is here. I'll hold my phone because I wrote the questions down here. Um, where do you work and what do you do? Ladies first, so I start uh, on my left hand with Charlotte. Please introduce work? yourselves. Thing. Oh, there is a Q&A, ah, beautiful. Nice. Is my mic on? Yes, my mic is on. Um, yeah. So my name is Charlotte, um, and now I work for uh, Jordan as the kids apparel merchandise manager for Europe, and I also do bags for both men's, women's, and kids. Sweet. Yes. And you just started at your new position, yes, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. yeah so just congrats. Just over a month ago, so thrown in the deep, but loving it so far. Sweet. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Of course. On your left hand, Randy. Hi. Hi, Hi everyone. My name is Randy. Uh, I work for Foot Locker. I've been with the company for 12 years. Uh, new to the, to the European division, but I oversee the kids' business as well as women's at the moment, uh, overseeing just the, uh, the buying team. So happy to be here, and thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Carsten. Okay, I guess it's me. Hi, I'm Carsten. Um, just moved back to Amsterdam last year and started at Fila as head of color and material design. So uh, very different than other brands, but uh, helping there like, to bring nice storytelling to the brand. And I see someone nicking, nice. Um, yeah, <laughs> Carsten, Fila, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Last but not least. Yes. Hi everyone, I'm Martin. I'm a senior product manager for Adidas Originals over in Herzog and Auroch. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> And we actually have two internationals that moved you for the work and one national that yes. left us, right? Yeah. Yeah, because you're based in Germany now. I'm based in Germany. Yeah. Uh, before, I was in Boston actually working over at Reebok. Um, first in the Reebok archive and then a uh, product manager for Club C. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. So as a host, I don't like to ask a question and go one by one by one. So just either drop an open question and wait for someone to reply, and you can add on to each other, or just address a person when nobody's speaking. Um, so you all, most of you have had different positions at different companies or within one company. The position in the company you're in now, what was your latest or your biggest wow moment? Is there something you'd like to share with us? Well, I just started, but I already, within one month of working uh, for Jordan, I placed my first buy for Europe for um, summer 23. So we already bought that for kids apparel. And that's what I did actually on Friday. So I think that for me was already one of my big things to do, especially since it was my first month at the company. So I think that for me then, for this position would be my wow moments. So within a month, yeah. Yes, yeah. it was a turn in deep, but we made it work. <laughs> Sweet, congrats. Yes. I think maybe for me, uh, not so much of a wow, but more like a kind of, I did not know that after all these years. So having worked for ASICs and for Nike, like big corporate companies, now working for Fila, which is more like a licensee based company, that's a very different muscle, a very different setup, how you like uh, have to interact with each other, how you have to like approach product, how you have to approach uh, strategies and uh, market. Um, that was a big learning, I have to say. I think mine's the same as Carson's, but reversed. Um, so working at Reebok, I was mainly responsible for the Reebok Reserve range, uh, which was a smaller range of like highly storytelling driven product. Um, and now switching over to Adidas Originals, where I'm responsible for uh, the Terrace range as well as Superstar, which is huge. This is a lot of product um, and a lot of like people with opinions about it, a lot of value behind it. Um, that was a huge impact. It was a lot 
a lot more coming my way than in my previous role. Uh, but then on the other end, that's also the challenge, and it's, it's look, getting in there and just making sure to create all this amazing product for all these different levels. Uh, at Reebok, my focus was mainly on those like independent fashion, sneaker boutiques, uh, and now I'm making products for anyone from that level until the JDs and the Foot Lockers of the world, and just you know understanding all these different consumers, creating the right product for them. Um, and that was definitely a bit of a switch to what I've done before, um, but it's a very interesting uh, space to work in, uh, great to explore and learn new things and uh, apply the knowledge that I have to all sorts of different products within that range. Sweet, thank you. I do have one, yeah. So just <laughs> moved here from New York City. So I think overall a lot of wows in the last year, uh, just kind of understanding the European landscape and sneaker culture within Europe. And I think one of the wows that stick out to me, I'm actually wearing a pair of TNs right now and we talked about it mm -hmm. uh, prior, prior to sitting down and just kind of understanding the history and what it means in sneaker culture in certain communities, like the storytelling behind not just this shoe, but I'd say multiple brands and multiple franchises and, and icons um, within the, Europe is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is pretty interesting. So that, that would be for me. Is there something that pops out for you that you found surprising that was like very different from states or New York where you're based that you found out that we as Europeans... You guys you? rock your shoes. Like you, you really, you wear them, you buy them and you wear them and you rock them um, until the wheels fall off. I, I feel like that, that's what I've noticed uh, the, the most. Um, I feel like a lot of people, you know, collectors, they, uh, they kind of stash and, you know, they'll post about their shoes. But what's really cool uh, that I appreciate I've noticed is you guys actually, you, you wear your shoes here more so. Sweet. Yeah. Um, some of you have been working in the industry for quite some time. The industry has been changing, brands have been changing. Could you tell the audience, uh, maybe there's inspir like people, aspiring people that want to work in the industry, how you uh, entered the industry with your first job or some decisions you had to make along the way that might be still useful, interesting now, or maybe even something that changed over time drastically? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. I'll kind of walk you through my little career path. Started out working in retail, um, Nike store first, worked at Carhartt, work, work in progress, um, 75 here in Amsterdam. Um, on the side, I ran a, a sneaker blog slash community called Laceback, which was like the first Dutch-based uh, online community for, for sneaker fans. Um, I also did some blogging for the hundreds, um, worked, uh, I, I did a lot of online stuff just for online retailers, um, then eventually rolled into a role doing sales for Adidas Originals and Reebok Classics. Um, and then, like I said before, I moved to Boston, working in Reebok Archive, then moved into product management. Um, so a lot of different roles and a, a, a sort of a long path. Um, but it's the things you learn al along the way. Um, working in retail is definitely something that is of immense value because you talk with consumers, you see the shoes that they pick up the shelf, they see why they buy it or why they don't. Um, I know a lot of us here, we, you know, we care about the special shoes, the limited edition runs, the great stories. Um, but in the end, all these brands are making money with the classic, the basic shoes that aren't always crazy limited, don't have like the most insane source materials or whatever. So you learn to create shoes for everyday people. You learn what they, what they like, why they buy a certain shoe, and more especially why they don't buy a certain shoe, because they don't like the color, they don't like the fit, they think like, oh, this doesn't match this, or wow, I can see myself wearing this with that hat. And so just coming from that and also, you know, being, being, uh, writing about shoes and, and, and being in that community so deep, you learn that other side as well. Um, you learn about storytelling, you learn about going deep, about the history, about the reference points and things like that. Um, so I feel that all the things I've done before I ended up with one of the bigger corporate brands uh, really prepared me to um, for that role and, and just to soak in the knowledge of the brand, of the culture, but also of the everyday man and woman that goes to a store to buy just a cool pair of shoes. Did you do it, your younger self, did you do it deliberately knowing that you wanted to be in a position that you're in now or did it happen? I again? mean, it was always the end goal to like get closer to the fire and eventually, you know, make a shoe and go to a store and be like, that one's mine. <laughs> um, I think that's, you know, every, every, I think everybody here in the, in the audience will, will has that dream as well. Um, I didn't take any deliberate steps to get there. Um, it was definitely, you know, I followed 
um, what I, I did things I liked. I did things that I have the opportunity to do. Um, sometimes you need to make a side step to make a big step forward. Um, so, you know, I, I started in sales over at Adidas. I'm not a true, true sales guy. I'm not the guy who sits right in front of you and sells you that those, like, you know, 10 extra models to hit my target. I just wanted to sell good shoes to good people and make sure that your customer can find the shoes that they want in your store. Um, so even though that wasn't something that really appealed to me, I know that, you know, that gets your foot in the door, that gets you in the system. Um, and from there, you get to know people, you learn more, and you'll eventually have the opportunity to move around and, and get to a position that you really want to be, uh, which is where I'm at right now. Sweet. So, you know, it took a while, but uh, it took a couple of moves across oceans and stuff like that. But I'm... I'm, I'm finally where I really want it to be. Sweet. I can just follow up that because actually we know each other from these lace back t times and okay. me being uh, from Berlin originally. So the, back then you had like lace back, crooked tongs, sneaker TV in Germany. <clears throat> and um, yeah, at the same time, I had a similar pass. Like I was studying multimedia arts, like graphic design, web design, uh, and working in a sneaker store for Unisuka Tiger. And to be honest, I was into sneakers, but I did not see myself ending up doing what I'm doing today. Uh, and back then, sneakers was way more niche, and I, like, a, like back then, Air Max, or like a A6, or a Adidas New Balance, it was like a very small community, and I, I wrote my diploma about uh, these retro issue, uh, retro uh, bringbacks as a marketing uh, tool for these brands, instead of like, kind of like making money. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because of that, I got in connection with Essex Germany, and they said, you should talk to the European guys and then to make an a internship, trainingship there. And I'm like, haven't thought about that, but uh, sounds cool. Uh, let's try. And luckily got the chance to start my traineeship, which was planned for six months. So I thought, I'm going to do my traineeship. I have that name in my resume. I go back to Berlin and going to add up in like an ad agency or something. You know? But then uh, the traineeship got extended and then I stayed. So uh, that was 2009. Uh, was then, yeah, after that, uh, moved to Nike, moved to Portland, came back. Um, I really have to say, like, a, I think you should be willing to kind of like uh, leave home mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and uh, try things. Like, a, that's definitely like a be open for it's, while it's there. And it maybe like a go zigzag, don't go straight. Oh. You know, so. When you were writing your thesis or designing your thesis, did you have to speak to somebody at Essex, or was it that you thought it might be smart or that you were interested in it? Uh, I wanted to use them for my, because I was also making a book about Essex vintage sneakers, and I had like, of course, like a friends in the community that had like vintage sneakers, but I also wanted to have some from them and some insights. Hmm. So that's why I reached out to them and working for Essex slash Unitsuka Tiger in a store yeah. helped definitely. Oh, yeah. so, um, so I went to the headquarters in Germany, uh, made some pictures there and just started talking yeah. to people and then stayed in contact. So, uh, it's like, hey, I'm Karsten. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Randy, you worked for Foot Lock for 12 years, you said. Yeah, yeah. I, um, so I'm actually from the Boston area, born and raised. Uh, started with the company in the stores, so assistant manager, store manager. The company kind of bounced me around a little bit throughout the, the, the Northeast, which was cool. I agree with your comment. I, I agree you should always leave home, hence, hence me uh, here today. But uh, I, I mean, I, I'd say persistence and just kind of working my way to the headquarters, um, to Florida. Um, we have a headquarter office there. Um, and then to New York City. And I did a lot of merchandising, actually, as well as buying. Um, and I, I got this opportunity most recently to, to come to Europe. And I think I've always wanted a, a global perspective on sneaker culture. So uh, definitely, I, uh, I leaped at the opportunity. So it's my little story. Sweet. If you look back at your younger self, what was, if you look back at now being more mature, older, what was like a smart move without knowing that you were making a smart move? Not thinking, just like doing. Yeah, Sweet. just, I, I went I like with that. my gut. Yeah, for real. I just, I went with my gut and I, I kind of, I, I like being uncomfortable sometimes. And I think a lot of the, the moves I made, I didn't put a lot of thought into it. I just, not knowing what the outcome would be. And I agree, a comment you made about, Sometimes you got to go to the you go go to the side to get ahead, and a, a lot of moves I made were lateral, um, but definitely got me ahead in the long run. So, yeah, that's Sweet. advice I'd give myself to do it again. Good, thank you. 
Yeah, I think we all started in retail then. Uh, I started retail at a Dutch retailer, Men at Work, uh, in Utrecht. And there I did the footwear department. So that's where I started. And then um, I did graphic design. So I studied that as well. I didn't do any thesis on sneakers or anything like that. But um, after that, I moved to Amsterdam and I still worked in retail there. And then after I kind of asked the company because I did kind of a, a university course that I didn't like after a year. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> working full time in a store now. What do I want to do? I don't want to study anymore. And then I just wrote a letter to the headquarters of Men at Work. And I was like, do you have a position open? Do you want anyone? And they said, um, yeah, we just saw the, the footwear coordinator, but that's not a starting position. But we do have something in e-commerce there we think you would be good for. So I worked in e-commerce there for a bit, for one and a half year. And then after one and a half years, I was talking to my manager and he kind of said, yeah, where do you want to grow to? And I was like, well, I don't know. It wasn't a big team, so I was not sure. And then actually the person that was in the footwear position, he moved after a year. And then he talked to the manager in that team and he was like, you know, we know you love sneakers. You have very hard for culture and we think merchandising, we can teach you. So um, yeah, also leaped at that opportunity and that's how I got into merchandising. Because when you would have told me in high school, I would like doing Excels and pivot tables and stuff like that. I would have <laughs> told you you were crazy, <laughs> but I love it now. Um, and that's how I got from men at work. I went to the athlete's foot, which is another retailer. And I went to the global office in Amsterdam for that. Uh, which is more franchise based, so it's a bit different than uh, a Foot Locker or a JD, for example. But I worked there for four years, and I think what was nice was because it was franchised, the HQ was quite small. Um, and that's how I got into, although I was doing merchandising, I saw a lot of different parts of the business. So I also was quite involved in marketing, retail, uh, kind of how everything unfolded. And I think just learning about different parts of the business is really important, although it's not your role. Um, I think that really helped me a lot. And now after almost, I think, nine years together at two different retailers, I wanted to make a switch to a brand. And uh, yeah, that came onto my path in my LinkedIn inbox. So uh, here we are. Nice. I think you brought up a, a good point where you spoke to your manager and, and you said, you know, what what you really wanted. Uh, my, one of my best managers told me that a closed mouth doesn't get fed. Amen. Um, if you don't talk to people about what you want, and it's not always like bursting into the room and being like, I want to do this. It's more like, you know, talk about what drives you, where your passions are, um, show interest when you speak to other people within the company, um, you know, show who you are and um, that helps you grow in the future. Like people remember you eventually and when that opportunity comes up, they're like, oh yeah, that's that person. I remember speaking to them about such and such, you know, it might be worth speaking to them for this role. So yeah, put your, Put your ideas, put your thoughts, put your passion out there. Uh, don't expect like a return within like two months. Um, it's always, it's, you know, these are big companies. It's slow processes. It always takes a while, but you know, stick around, be, be who you are and, and uh, follow your dreams and, and your things. And sometimes that means going to different companies. Sometimes it means, you know, taking that little sidestep, doing something that isn't your ideal job, but might get you that ideal job down the line. Um, so yeah, speak up, be and, and be honest and open to you know what you want to do. I have, I'm sorry, but I have to back that up. Yeah, I think that's incredible advice, isn't it? I would, I would agree. No, I, I'd say uh, you hit on a, a lot of things that really I think touched me, and it's. Um, you know, when you talk about getting into the industry, I think the advice is, um, I, I'm big into manifestation. I think I've spoke a lot of what's happened to me in my career into existence. And I, I would say, if you if you have a passion for this and you have a passion for sneakers and a passion for the culture, um, you know, talk, talk to people, make that, you know, make that known. Um, everyone that you meet, you'll, you'll never know when they're gonna come back around in your career. So I just thought that was, that's really great advice. I would back yeah, that Yeah, exactly. Up. It can happen anytime, <clears throat> like how many, like, store parties Carson and I have hung out and just yeah. drank beers and, and talk about shoes like even though we you know never ended working together but you know we see each other today for the first time in what was it like four or five years maybe longer even yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it's just you know it's, it's just going back to where we were back then and it's the connections you made and you never know where that person may end up or where you might end up and you're able to help someone else definitely yeah. and I think actually in these days especially you use tools like Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, you know, like a, just be bold, like a reach out 
some might not get back, some might get back, ask questions, you know, like uh, connect, have a coffee, have a Zoom call these days, you know, like uh, use all the tools that you have and learn and, yeah, what you said, like make yourself known or learn and then things will happen. That's what I wanted to ask, because Martin, you, you had your freelance or side business, Charlotte, I know you do customization, which is an actual craft, but it's also online. Um, you all start in retail. We're living, that's like 10 plus, nine plus years for I think all of you at least. 2022, is retail still like, would you say retail is a very smart move if you're like 17, 18, 16 and a big lover of sneakers or would it be? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the easiest to get into and you learn so much. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, if you put in the time to really look at what's going on in the store that you're working in, whatever store that may be, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it could be a small boutique, it could be a big chain store, um, you know, be interested, ask questions, talk to your manager, talk to the person in charge, like what's moving, what's not moving, uh, you know, what are their experiences, um, you know, why did you buy that shoe? Ask your buyer, well, yeah. why is that shoe on the shelf? Was there a specific reason for it? Did the brand push it? Did you believe into it? Is there a history of that shoe within your store or your chain? Um, it's all those things you learn and then, you know, talk to your customers. If they're in the store and they buy a shoe, like ask them why they picked that shoe or if they try a shoe on and they don't buy it, like what did you, didn't you like about the shoe? Is it the comfort, mm. is it the fit, is it the color? Those are all things that you pick up just from doing retail job. And even if it's just, you know, that, that Saturday um, and, and the rest of the week you're studying or doing something else, you pick up a lot of knowledge that is very valuable once you eventually climb the corporate ladder and get into these like meeting rooms with people that might have been in the company for 20 plus years and did like, you know, whatever university uh, course they did to land there they often do not have that connection with the people in the street. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are able to articulate that and bring that into those meetings and into uh, the company, that's very, very valuable. Sweet, thank you. I see like the other three panelists nodding. Yeah. So. For sure. Yeah. And I think also that by doing that, I maybe it also maybe shows you like uh, the different fields that are in the industry. I mean, all of us kind of like as merchandise, it's all like sales and like design. But even like by doing that, what you just mentioned, like uh, collecting insights. You can do insights for yeah. uh, the industry. You can do development. You can do supply chain. So there's so much more that you actually, besides the final product, of course, that's uh, often like the most desirable, but there's actually so much more you can like uh, get into the industry, get, getting close to the sneakers uh, and being part of a company or big brand. Right now. So that, I do that. That's really great advice. I think about all the different functions within Foot Locker, yeah. uh, and here I have some marketing counterparts. Uh, shout out to them in the in the crowd here. But um, you know, marketing and planning and, and e-commerce and supply chain. I mean, there's so many facets to this industry that you can get into. Um, absolutely. Sweet. We here at Sneakerness. Uh, I think most people here have a love. We all have a shared love for sneakers. I'm sure a lot of people come towards all of you with their love for sneakers, thinking this and that. What is the biggest misconception? And by the way, if there's any questions, we still have a mic. I'm just chatting, so please make sure make yourself known um, and do interrupt. I, I think it's, it's a business. It's really a business. We're all interested in this really, really, really smart subject, subset of that business. We care about something that in the end barely makes the company any money. Of course, it gives you know it gives authenticity and it builds a certain hype, um, but in the end, that's not where the money is made, and that's also not where a ton of the jobs are. Um, so you know you can walk into whatever company and be like, "Yo, I want to do the hyper strikes. I want to do the limited editions." They're like, "Yeah, no." Um, so when you walk in, don't be afraid. Even though everybody's wearing sneakers and not you know suits and ties. It's a business, it's corporate, uh, it's a slow moving system, it's about money, it's about margins, it's about all the stuff that isn't cool, um, but it helps you eventually do cool shit. How does it match with your passionate and, and uh, culture itself? You learn to adjust. You learn to like find the point, uh, find the points where you can shine, where you can bring something else in. You learn to create space for yourself to do cool shit. 
So you know if you do the stuff that isn't the most exciting, um, but brings in money, that allows you to do something a little, little off the side <clears throat> that is just cool, that just isn't about doing a ton of units, but you know it speaks to a certain consumer and it speaks to you as well, and mm -hmm. you're proud of that little project. And you're also proud of the shoe that you did that just sold like a shit ton of pairs. But you know that's, that's where you get that certain fulfillment. Yeah, just talking from the design side, it, it's so true. Like, <clears throat> the thing is, if you build a collection, right, and uh, you always say, okay, if you cover the business, right, the so sales, everyone is happy, like they get what they need, and the mm -hmm. business is growing, that gives you space to really create the, the product that's high on top. You know, that's when you can have more, go deeper into details, can play with materials, color blocking, all these things, when you have covered the essentials, the business. Like it's like a pyramid, right? Like that's um, yeah. In thinking of my previous job, someone always told me that I always, when we were buying at my retail, that I always liked the difficult sneakers. So they were like, yeah, but those are not where the numbers are. So you get those for a couple of stores and then for the rest we'll buy the other ones. Because I always thought they, they were most of the time boring. Um, so that's what she always told me. And actually, uh, again, having to do with more aspirational items and commercial items, I often now have uh, discussions, of course, with retail partners or with salespeople and they want to have everything as commercial as possible but then from a merchandising perspective I also need to think about how you want to build it up as a brand even in apparel for kids um, and then I always have to tell them yeah but for design this is a storytelling behind it it connects to this footwear story like we need to keep it a certain way although it's not the most commercial we have other products for that so I think that's always a balance that you need to find and yeah it's, it's not always about the most cool stuff but it's also not always about selling the most and it's just always finding a good balance yeah. between those hi sorry can I ask a question Please. Sorry, I didn't know if I'm allowed to interrupt or not, but I'm going to ask Yes, a please. Cool. Stand up and introduce yourself as well, please, since we're here. Sorry. Hi, I'm Steph. Um, I'm from Women in Sneakers. Uh, that's a podcast that I run that interviews women in the sneaker industry. Follow if you want to. Um, so my question is about the business of sneakers. So that's kind of what you guys are talking about. Um, luxury collaborations. There's a lot of them at the moment, um, especially with like specific brands. Do you see them as beneficial or do you see them as detrimental to kind of like the sneaker scene? That's my question. Oh, it's a good one. Who, who that's a on very that double-sided question. Um, so if you talk about the sneaker scene versus corporate interest, um, those often do not align. Um, so corporate looks at creating hype moments, creating headlines, creating interactions on the various social media platforms. Um, so doing those collaborations definitely helps. It get every, gets everybody talking about your brand because you're collaborating with this other hype brand. Um, for the average sneaker consumer, um, is it always beneficial? Is it, you know, do you want to spend that amount of money on a product from a brand where you usually buy the shoes for a lot more of an affordable price. I mean, it's up to you, right? Um, in the end, a shoe is a shoe. Um, a 600 euro shoe is not six times better than a 100 euro shoe as far as materials and things concerned. Um, so there's, there's obviously people that love it. Um, sometimes these collaborations really push forward design. Sometimes they excel in storytelling in a way that the brand couldn't do it themselves. Um, so yes, there's value in it. Is there value in every, each and every one of them? No. Um, like most things, there's a balance. And there are uh, certain things that each brand wants out of these collaborations. Um, but yeah, in the end, you know, it's always like, if you like it, buy it. Um, and, and don't worry too much about the strategies of the brands as a consumer. You know, if a product's good, that it's for you. Go ahead, buy it, wear it, love it. Randy. Yeah, no, I think authenticity really matters. Like why are these two brands or two people coming together? Um, you see, a, it, and it kind of dilutes the, the collaboration space when you see just kind of logo slapping, like this brand matches up with this brand. You know, we're gonna, you know, quickly get, get a, you know, a, a quick buck out of this collab and keep it moving. But I, I really, um, I think we as consumers, we can see through that, right? And I, I think as, as, as sneaker of culture moves forward and collaborations kind of, you know, change and evolve, um, I think that's really important is the authenticity of why these, you know, two partners are coming together. So I think that's how you're going to see it kind of evolve in the future. And if I'm looking at your uh, feats, yeah. you deliberately chose these today. 
right? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is it in this? And in this collaboration, what is it in these for you? For me, so Supreme is. I mean, I'm Supreme is Supreme. You know, <laughs> you know what can <laughs> we say? <laughs> so I, I've actually, as 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 a Foot Locker, you know. Die Hard, you know, TN means a lot. You can, in my opinion, you can't really talk about the shoe without mentioning Foot Locker and vice versa. So there's a lot of history here. And then one of my favorite brands, you know, Supreme comes along with my favorite shoe that really resonates with, you know, my, you know, what I do for a living. That that just kind of spoke to me. So that was uh, more of a personal connection, I think, here. But sweet, yeah, that's a good looking shoe. Appreciate you. <laughs> Any other thoughts towards uh, Steph's question? No, but I want to say I follow your Instagram. Yay. <laughs> no, but I totally agree with Brandy as well on the authenticity part and definitely on how the product is developed, I think is uh, very important. And yeah, again, it's a, it's a collaboration. It's a business, but I think it's in the end uh, for these luxury collaborations, definitely about the product, whether it's worth it or not. Sweet. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's... Um as you said, the collaborations evolved. And I think they have been done. There was a time there were a lot of like a store collaborations. And then there was a time there were a lot of artist collaborations. I think right now is maybe a time there's a lot of luxury collaborations. So let's see what comes after that. Because I think we are like the consumer. We, we are consumers as well, right? Like a, we want to move forward. We want to push. And we also, at a certain point, you get used to certain things. So you get, don't want to say get tired, but you get used to it. Mm -hmm. So then like, what's next, you know? Then uh, maybe you go back to something store or you go back to something, no collaborations for a while, who knows, you know? Like a, uh, make classics more, like a, just make a good shoe and then the shoe sells, you know? Like, I think it's also really up to the consumer, how a consumer like uh, act with the brands that pushes brands into a certain direction to answer that demand. So let's see what's next. And I think also, you know, talking about that consumer, we've seen that shift from sneakers being this really niche thing, um, you know, concentrated in like the big cities and small stores to now being super global. Um, yeah, you see a lot of high fashion collaborations because a lot of people that shop in high fashion stores want to wear sneakers. Um, usually, you know, they can't find those in those stores. You can't walk into a high fashion store and buy a Jordan 1 usually. You have to go to a more dedicated sneaker store. So these are ways to get products into those high fashion stores without drastically changing uh, distribution strategies as a brand, uh, but still meeting the consumer where they are with your product. Smart move. Yep. Yeah. Randy, we didn't uh, have your answer yet to uh, the biggest misconception. I'm curious because you've been within one company for 12 years. Yes. So what is the biggest misconception about working at Foot Locker or being in a position that you're in now? Like that one question people always, or that, that thought that people... Yeah, I, I think we uh, we touched on it a little bit and it's not all like, it's not all fun. You're not just like picking out shoes. So I oversee a team of buyers, uh, like I said, the kids and women's business specifically. And although that's, the most fun part of the job, working on SMUs, which are, you know, exclusives and working with our brand partners and, and designers like that, by all means, is the fun part of the job. But that's uh, a pretty small percentage in the grand scheme. So, you know, it, we're a, a global company, we're a public company. So there's financial targets, there's uh, negotiations, there's a, a lot of things on the side um, that can that can bring stressors or, you know, just a little bit of headache to the job. Um, but at the end of the day, I tell my team, like, how cool is it that we get to do this for a living? You know what I mean? How cool, look at the industry we're in. And I think as long as you have that mindset and you always go back to why you're here, the passion, and really the fun within the job, um, you're good. But th there's, there's moments, you know. I think that's the biggest misconception. That's a good link up to the next question. Um, what's an important skill or mindset that you need to either work in the company that you work for or to be in a position that you're in? <laughs> Might be a misconception as well that people don't assume that you need that, but it might be very handy. Talking for design, I think you have to be able to take criticism. That's something you have to learn. I have to say, like, looking back at myself, like when I started, it was definitely harder. I got used to it with the days, years. Uh, the thing is, like, a, like from first concept to until the shoe gets launched, there's so many steps in between, and we just talked about it, that mm -hmm. part of the misconception. There's so many opinions until the shoe gets launched. Okay, shoe comes to the market, uh, gets posted on Hypees, High Snobiety, all these blogs, and reading the comments. The thing is, you will never make everyone happy. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so like, read over the comments, this can be fun too. 
Uh, but I think in design, it's like a, like be open for feedback, uh, learn to take criticism, you know, in a, a, a positive, constructive way, uh, and take it from there. And let's uh, take, let's move on, you know, like, like okay, this glass is like a round, should be like a, a cornered, let's make it cornered, all good, you know, if there's a reason. I'm following up from my position. I'm, I'm the person that tells him that the, the glass should be cornered instead of round. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so on, on that end, it's communication. Um, you know, you have your ideas, you have your thoughts, you have your insights. Um, how do you communicate those? Um, how do you make sure that you work together well with other people? If you sit down with a design, you just don't come in and say like, this is what we're gonna do, work together create something that feels good to you both and then also, of course, feels good to the end consumer because that's the most important person in the entire equation of creating shoes. Uh, he makes shoes so that they get sold and make money. Um, but yeah, communicating, um, you know, being able to support your thoughts with facts, with data, things like that, uh, and not just come in and scream like, I want it in orange because that's my favorite color. Uh, that, you know, that, is that you why. speaking from the position you're in now, or would you yeah, think? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's me speaking from you know a product marketing position. Yeah, uh, where we are responsible for sort of creating the range, um, working with design to create the right shoes. So bringing in the insights from the markets uh, to make shoes that the people out there want to buy, pretty much. Actually, jumping back on that, I think that totally right. I think it doesn't matter actually which position you are or if there's a change. <clears throat> you should be able to explain why. Mm -hmm. And I think even like in life, right? If you have like a, if you if you don't agree on certain thing, like I should I should be able to explain why I don't agree or why I think things should be that way. Uh, and maybe to add for design, and that also brings it back how to make it into the industry is if you work on your portfolio, and it's the same actually if you present your designs within the company, is take people on your journey. Like uh, don't just pr uh, uh, present like a, a final product. Also present like, a, um, well, it's always important to present kind of, for who is it, who's the consumer, like why you're doing it, what is the trend that, that you wanna follow or you wanna create, uh, what is the inspiration, what's the mood. Mm -hmm. So how did you get to that final product? And then it's also easier for uh, product line management, merchandise, sales, or even like the uh, sales reps on the floors in the store to sell that product and to explain to the consumer like, hey, this shoe, it, it has a story behind, here's the nickname, and then it's more clear. I can imagine though, there's some positions, number, like numbers speak, right? So I think in your position, you have to explain a lot and convince and, and probably the, the dynamic between the two of you. But if you're in finance, it's like, yeah, this is the market. So this is explaining itself already. That's but, very true. But that brings back what I said earlier, like uh, if sales comes and says, hey, we need for Food Locker or for JD, these like essentials, yeah. then there's no overthinking. That's yeah. what you need that covers the business. You know, but then when it to comes do. to kind of like a, a stores like a, a size or a snipes or like a food patrol or like a higher level tiering stores, mm -hmm. that's when it becomes more like a 50-50 and like a collaboration within the company yeah. uh, that uh, like business and design work together and uh, work together like, okay, who do we want to actually like reach? You know, and then why do we create... Why do we create that shoe for that moment? You know, like that shoe, shoe should have like a, a footwear or apparel should have a reason to exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you work within the machine. So if you make sure that, you know, the sales needs are covered, you have the space to create something that isn't necessarily about sales. Yeah. Uh, question. Sorry. Oh, yeah. so sorry, Charlotte. Go ahead, please. No worries. You can go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I don't know. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah. Uh, I work in events at Foot Locker, and I swear Randy did not pay me to ask a question. <laughs> um, for the women only, uh, what have been some of the proudest moments or kind of a challenge that you've overcome where it really made you feel empowered as a woman in this industry? Oh, that's go a good question. question. Is that <laughs> assuming that uh, it's still a male driven industry we're in, we're talking about? Aren't they all? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> take it as you want, I guess. It okay. doesn't have to necessarily be a thing like that. Oh, that's a good one. Um, actually, the last job I was in at the Athletes Foot, uh, we basically had an all-female head headquarters. So that was nice. Our CEO was also female. Um, but I think just being able to create stuff together, I don't think there is things necessarily for me as a female, as a younger person in a leading position towards... Uh, older people, 
that was for me, I think, a big triumph because I, the athlete's foot is franchise based. So you have to deal with uh, a lot of different people that um, only work for their market. So either they have a region of countries or they work for one country. And I started that position when I was 25. And I was mostly talking to, I must say men, um, that were older than me. And I sometimes kind of had to tell them what we wanted to do and how to drive our strategy and Some of them were okay with it. Others were less okay with that. Um, but I think growing into that role, and I would say growing up in that role because I did it for almost four years, I think going through those meetings and talking and being able to explain myself, as we just said, and really um, back it up with facts, data, I think that's really something I learned and that's something I'm really proud of. And yeah, as they say, I think that's essential for the business that we're in. So I think... For me, that was a, a big one, especially when it's like 12 people in front of you and they all have something to say. And for their market, all of the needs are different and you need to kind of listen to all of them, but still focus on what you want as a retailer to kind of put forward to your consumer. So I think that's something I'm really proud of that I've learned over the nice. past job I had. Nice. nice. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, I, I can't think of like a, a one specific moment that, you know, I was proud kind of as a female in the industry. I'll say, I think one of the reasons I've spent 12 years with Foot Locker is um, all the opportunities have been given. I mean, you, you look at our company here in Foot Locker Europe, uh, we have a, a female president, which I think is, uh, you know, that makes me really proud. Um, I'd also say the things that Foot Locker stands for, you know, sneaker culture, youth culture, Um, you know, things we've taken a stance against, whether it's social and racial injustice, like things like that, like make me really proud, um, I'd say to, to work for the company. But as a female specifically, I do feel like an equal in the room. I think that's, again, that's one of the reasons I've, I've, I've stayed, uh, for the company for so long. So that'd be mine. Nice. We already addressed it a bit in between questions, um, but still might be nice to pinpoint it, um. What's the smartest move you've made? I think for mine, it was going from e-commerce to merchandising, although I didn't know if I would like it or not. Um, I just know I had a passion for the product and I kind of wanted to do that. And I just took that leap and just did it. And the first couple of weeks, I was like, what in the hell am I doing with Excel? I don't understand any of all these spreadsheets that he was making, because he was really good, but my manager was also bad at explaining himself and how he made these incredible looking spreadsheets. So most of the time I didn't know what he was talking about, but um, just sticking it out and just working through it because I know I love the product that I was working with, I think is yeah something I really loved and I think that's helped me so much where I'm at now. So. So taking a deep dive and just going for yes, it. Yes, just going for it. Nice. And as Brandy said, not thinking, <laughs> just yeah, doing. Just go, go. It has to be moving from New York to, to Amsterdam. I think that was uh, just a, a kind of a game changer for me in, in my career and just perspective on this, this global uh, industry. <clears throat> Similar for me, like moving from Berlin to Amsterdam, moving from Amsterdam to Portland, coming back. Yeah, I think like a moving, you know, don't stand still. I think that's a smart move. Yeah, kind of same for me. Um, when I started at Originals at, at Adidas, I was in the Benelux um, market, which at the time was in Lowesden, a uh, very small town far away from anything cool. Uh, they now have moved actually into the Amsterdam office, uh, which is a lot more uh, bustling than it was when I was there. but. You know, I was in a small office. I was I was pretty much the only guy that really was into sneakers in, in the cultural way, uh, like most of us here. Um, so I knew I had to break out. I, I had to go outside of that space. You know, I could have stuck around there for a long time, could have easily uh, continued my uh, career over there. But I knew I had to make a big move. And for me, that was the move to Boston, um, you know, leaving, leaving my, my family and friends behind. Um, marrying my wife, so she was able uh, to come with me. Um, but yeah, just just you know, making that big move, taking a big step, and yeah, in the end, you know, it, it paid off. Does a move within this industry, well, probably within other industries as well, but kind of uh, resonates really going for it? Because the move in itself is a move, you'd say, like. But then all of you, like. 
you're still here and from here. Still but here. the three of you have, like you all mentioned, moving like to other countries. It comes with the whole of giving up, like you said, what you had. And then <clears throat> is it giving, it, does moving an equal giving it your all somehow? I think it's definitely a, uh, comes with sacrifices. Mm. Like what you said, like leaving family and friends behind. Uh, but it also comes with opportunities and uh, opens perspective of things, you know, and figuring things out. And uh, like you meet new people, you meet uh, different people and you see different things you, that you might have never seen if you wouldn't have done that move. And that, that's something that no one can take away anymore. Like whatever happens, but uh, like having spent five years in Portland, no one can take that away, what I learned there or yeah. like uh, what I experienced there, you know. So, but I can take that now here to Amsterdam, so. Yeah, it's always good to leave your comfort zone. Experience new things, meet new people, see new places, learn things. Those are super valuable experiences that you take with you no matter where you go for the rest of your life. Um, so, you know, making that move, doing something different, doing something that's out of your comfort zone, that might be a little bit scary, just just go for it and, and you know, see, see where, See where you end up, see where it takes you. Maybe that's the main thing. Like, you can just go and try. Like, I had also enough friends that moved, but after like six months or a year, they said, that's not my thing, and mm -hmm. stopped and moved back. But they tried. You tried. You know, that's the that's that's main, main thing, try. Yeah. Due to time, we have five minutes left. Uh, still, if there's any questions, please feel free. We already touched upon it a little bit, but still. What tips do you have for someone that wants to enter the industry now? That, I'm curious, because you all talked about entering from retail. Um, I think accessing retail when you're 16 or 17 is easier than when you're 35 or 40. And not everybody here is 16 or 17 in the audience. So for like a person of your own age now, but also for like a younger person, what's a smart move if you're not within the industry yet, but you would like to be? So I think one of the most important thing is figure out what your value is. What do you bring to the table? Um, you know, we all love shoes. That's not reason enough to get a job at these companies. So what is what is the insight that you bring? What is the knowledge that you bring? Um, and it doesn't always, like, like Carson said before, it doesn't always need to be product related. If you're really good in, you know, Excel, you can turn that into a job at a sneaker company. Um, because if you're really good at doing Excels and you actually know what's inside those Excels instead of just you know uh, article numbers, that gives you an advantage. Um, so take what you have, take the skills and knowledge that you have and add your passion to it. And that gives you that one up versus that other person that's also applying for that job. How do you find out though that, because often if we have knowledge or skills, it's like normal to us, so it's hard to realize that you have something that might be useful for you. Uh, if you're not within the industry, how do you know where your skill, how do you find out like what might be added value that is? That's a really good question. But network, I see you want to answer it, so I'm going to give it to like, you. Yeah, I mean, like you, you have us here today and I hope a few of you have, you know, talk to us afterwards and, and I mean network, get to know people in the industry and I think um, uh, one of the one of the things that's worked for me is I've had people who believed in me more than I did myself over the years, right? So um, I, I think it takes another person to see that in you uh, to help bring you along in, you know, in this industry. So I would say put yourself out there, network, uh, get to know as many people as you can and by all means someone's gonna bring you along in the journey. And I think to get there maybe what I would say like also like all big brands have like this little click down button for jobs. Go there and read different jobs. Like they, 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 there you have job descriptions that say like uh, what the company will give you, what the other company expects from you. And then you can see kind of these things like uh, how much of that you have, how much it, does that fit with you. Uh, and if there's nothing, then check the next job. Like th there's like so many different jobs in these uh, career kind of fields. But read, read the job descriptions and then check like uh, what, su what suits you, what, where do you feel uh, like uncomfy or comfy or where, do you, where could you see yourself and then start reaching out to people in that field or in the surrounding fields to learn more about that. Again, the goal is to get in, right? Yeah. So like get in, you, you, whatever, You're, you know, you might be a financial planner and that's not really what you wanted to do, but get into the industry and by, once you're in, it's easy to kind of move around, yeah. move up, yeah, but for yeah. sure. 
Um, we live in, in digital times. Um, a lot of people are doing things on the side. Two of you have been doing things on the side. How important is your um, visibility or your being within the industry already? Or could you come from a job that's not sneaker related but have a big love for sneakers wanting to enter a brand or a retail company? <clears throat> or do you think like, oh, it's very these days we're always looking at like online profiles or what you have been doing or do you think you can still survive without? So I, like I'm not, I'm moving in the periphery and I always feel like, oh, you need to be somebody already to enter, but that's just maybe a misconception I have. I, I think um, a lot of these companies have big HR departments and they do not have time to look up your Instagram because they go through hundreds of applications for a job. Um, it helps that when you get the, get the interview, you're able to show a couple things, mm -hmm. um, and maybe you know your future manager looks you up. Um, it's not a must. I know a lot of people have you know their Instagram closed. That's not a weird thing these days. Um, so don't overdo it. Don't think like you need to build a social media persona. Um, I know the most. I know some of the most interesting people that work in this business post nothing about yeah. shoes on their social media. So um, don't get don't get hung up on that. Good, thank you. Yeah, I think like being authentic is actually maybe even better because <clears throat> like that industry is also changing and like a lot of um, hiring managers looking forward to building like diverse teams. So you need different personas in that team from all ways of life. So then be yourself and show like a, what is your character and um, where you come from. And I think that can be actually really helpful. Sweet. Due to time, it's 5.30. Is there anything, uh, I'm looking at the audience, if something's coming, we'll pick it up. If, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you, the panel, would like to share with the audience that you think like, oh, if we talk about uh, grabbing the bag in this 2022, what is one thing like, please like keep that in mind, do that, go for it. Any last? Just, just be you, Carson. Carson really touched upon that. Be authentic, be yourself, be passionate in whatever you do. Uh, even if it's not sneakers, even if it's something else and you still have an interest in sneakers, you know, show who you are, show what drives you, what gets you out of bed in the morning, what gets you excited. Um, that's, that's the most valuable thing that you can bring to a company. Passion. Not not having a hundred plus sneakers yeah. in your closet. Yeah, for sure. Passion <laughs> goes a long way. And I will say, you know, when you make it into the industry, you know, pay it forward, bring others along with you, right? So I think about, you know, people on my team, I, I can't wait in a couple of years, they're here talking to you guys about, you know, their their experience in the industry. I think it's really important to pay it forward and uh, and bring others along as well. I think for me, it's just wanting to learn and never stop learning about all the facets of the business. So not just specifically your job, but also I have to do with supply chain, with e-commerce, with uh, everything else. I think just wanting to learn more. And I think that also gives you clarity on how you want your path to evolve as saying maybe you're in a job or you starting out at a job that you're not fully um, happy with. Um, maybe because of learning through other parts of the business, you'll find whatever that sweet spot is that you're looking for. So, yeah, I would definitely say That's that. That's really good advice. Being a student of the business, we call it. Just always wanting to know more uh, and never being really happy with kind of where you're at. I, I think that's really strong. Sweet. Thank you, guys. Before we round up, um, they're here. So if you have any questions, if you want to introduce yourselves, this is your chance. They'll represent or work for... Uh, interesting companies how do you, this is being recorded so maybe somebody's still shy maybe somebody's seeing this later on how do you want people to reach out to you later on after you leave today and how can they find you where can they find you how do they connect ig hey <laughs> instagram linkedin yeah yeah absolutely exactly. Beautiful. i think we got tagged in the sneakerness post so yeah you can all Find us, I think, on uh, Instagram or LinkedIn. I think that's the easiest. Sweet. Okay, then that's it for us today. Thank you, Martin, Carsten, Randy, and Charlotte. Thank you, thank guys. You. For thank you. And thank, thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Shout out to Carmen, our host. Thank you. Thank you.